Bienvenue. Thank you everyone for coming to the 45th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing. Oh, wait, are our captions working? Okay. Yep. Okay, sorry. Bienvenue. Thank you everyone for coming to the 45th event of Disrupting Disruptions, the Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ketchum, and I'm a professor of feminist and social justice studies at McGill and the organizer of the series. The Feminist and Accessible Publishing, Communications, and Technologies Practices Speaker and Workshop Series seeks to bring together scholars, creators, and people in industry working at the intersections of digital humanities, computer science, feminist studies, disability studies, communication studies, LGBTQ studies, history, and critical race theory. We are hosting 10 virtual events this fall. You can find our full schedule as well as video recordings of our past events at disruptingdisruptions.com. So that's the redirect URL disruptingdisruptions.com. The other URL is way too long to remember. You can also find our list of sponsors, including Shirk, Milieu, Mila, and the Indigenous Futures Lab, as well as others at our website. For this event, recording is enabled so that the event can be possibly embedded on our website. Don't worry, only the speakers will be shown in the video. We also have a Q&A option available. So throughout the talk, you may type your questions into the Q&A answer box and there will be some time at the end for Dr. Renzi to answer them. We can't guarantee that every question will be answered, but we are grateful to the discussion that you generate. Thank you to our captioner for today, Debbie. Past series speakers, Suzanne Kite and Jess McLean have pointed to the physical and material impacts of the digital world. While the events this semester are virtual, everything that we do is tied to the land and the space that we are on. We must always be mindful of the land that the servers enabling our virtual events are on. Furthermore, as the series seeks to draw attention to power relations that have been invisibilized, it is important to acknowledge Canada's long colonial history and current political practices. This series is affiliated with the Institute for Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies of McGill University. McGill University is currently located in Jojoge, Montreal, on unceded Ganyangahaga territory. Furthermore, the ongoing organizing efforts by indigenous communities such as the West Wallen people at the Inisuan camp make clear the ever-present and ongoing colonial violence in Canada. Interwoven with this history of colonization is one of enslavement and racism. This university's namesake, James McGill, enslaved black and indigenous peoples. It was in part from the money he acquired through these violent acts that McGill University was founded. These histories are here with us in this space and inform the conversations we have today. I encourage you to learn about the lands that you are on. Nativeland.ca is a fantastic resource for doing so. Now for today's event, Dr. Alessandra Renzi is Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Concordia University. Dr. Renzi's interdisciplinary work explores the linkages and relays between media, art, and civic engagement through community-led research, ethnographic studies, and media projects. She has studied pirate television networks in Italy, the surveillance of social movements in Canada after 9-11 and housing and data justice in Indonesia. Her current research investigates how society's increasing reliance on platforms, algorithms, and AI is changing urban landscapes and community organizations alike. She is the PI of a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council SHARC Insight Grant titled on the margins of the platform economy, community-led responses to technical gentrification with focus on Montreal's Park X neighborhood. I continue to think about so many lines from her fantastic book, Hack Transmissions. On page 82, Dr. Renzi writes, the ability to hack and connect into assemblages is by no means an intrinsically emancipatory process. Then what does resistance look like and what is the function of media within resistant formations? I also really appreciate the distinction in the book between media connective versus media collective. I look forward to more of her insights during today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Renzi. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And thank you everyone. It's great to see so many people and so many familiar faces. This is actually, I was um, mentioning to Alex, it's the first time I am talking about this book in a public um, lecture. Um, so it's the official launch of the book, even though it came out in March um, 2020. It was right in the middle of the pandemic and it didn't feel um, too pandemic appropriate um, in terms of topics. So um, let me start the um, 
the screen share. I have some slides here. Uh, okay, is it working? Yep, it's working, it looks great. Yeah, okay, it's working, perfect. So uh, this book is a labor of love and collaboration um, and militant research with media activists in Italy that started in 2002. And when I was um, thinking about how to talk about the book, I was at a bit of a loss because it wasn't, um, it's kind of hard to talk about a book that is so rooted in the energy of being on the streets together in, um, you know, in, um, and also in, um, it's also very rooted in mobilizing um, concepts and ideas through writing. And so um, it's been uh, quite hard to think about how to um, talk about it in uh, such a um, short, period of time. Um, it's hard because it's hard to convey how friendship and collaborative inquiry have transformed me, uh, both as a researcher and as an organizer. Um, working with my uh, friends um, at, while media making and also researching was really more than just showing, uh, you know, like a show of different hats. I have experienced how relations, um, the, the relations that we form and embody through research and making um, really shape our self-perception and understanding of the world. So I'm starting this talk with practices that subjectivize us because what we do with other people and what we do with technology can make us what we are. Um, so what I'm um, talking about really comes from experiences um, that I have had over quite a long uh, span of time and um, that I'm going to present here to think through how movements come into composition and become with technology. Oh, okay. The, um, in particular, I'd like to discuss the relations among movements. When we talk about social movements, we often talk about the relations between movements and the state, whereas I am actually uh, paying attention to how movements relate to each other and focusing in particular on practices of social reproduction and collective care. At the core of my research are really three, um, three main issues. Um, how compositionality makes the social fabric political, um, what keeps groups together in the activist field and what forms of inquiry could embolden organizing. And these issues lead to posing uh, questions about politics uh, in a different way uh, and to consider horizontal relations um, at the same time as the relations that are used to challenge power. So I'm going to look at modes of relation and here I mean not just practices but also effective exchanges. Um, because these are what makes a collective. This is what a collective requires to become a collective. So let me first um, just get a few ontological clarifications about the nature of individuality and collectivity out of the way. And I'm happy to talk more about this with the, th the theory heads in the Q&A. Uh, most of my um, theoretical framework is based on the work of it of Italian autonomous Marxist and feminist on the philosophy of science and technology of Gilbert Simondon and on new materialism. So for me in, um, in this book and in general, individuals and groups are not considered um, complete entities as atoms that um, form relations. Um, relations have ontological primacy. So they have ontological status at this, um, you know, as well as what we call an individual or a collectivity and a collectivity. And when we move the emphasis from the constituted terms um, of these entities to the operations that are set in place and that constitute um, what becomes uh, a collective or an individual, then it's possible to focus on processes of mutual engendering and on thresholds of change. And this, this focus on process is what I found was necessary to study social movements in a time where um, so much is focused on the uh, identity of movements. Um, also, um, Exploring the relationality um, shifts our understanding of intersubjectivity away from uh, conscious discursive exchanges, you know, framing in a way, to um, the level of affectivity and emotion. And I'm going to tell you more about how this uh, is particularly important for me. So just 
you know, to go back, um, I don't see the individual as um, the basis of collectivity, rather collectivity is seen from the perspective of the relations that constitute it. Um, each relation has the status of being, so it exists simultaneously with the, ter the terms uh, to which relation grants being. Um, so in other words, in more practical terms, um, people and groups are not um, static object objects. They are the, in a way, the side effects of interaction uh, in an environment that um, triggers uh, constant transformation. Um, so to understand how becoming happens, I ask, how do activist groups come into composition? How do they connect, um, disconnect, and reconnect? And with this question, I don't want to focus on how groups retain their identity, their configuration, or their initial purpose, um, you know, their atom-like stability. Um, I want to examine how they pass thresholds after which they cease to be what they are and either scatter away or um, you know, take on different structures. This move away from social morphology um, to understanding movements as always in process um, allows me to consider how organizes Ch uh, organizing changes across cycles of uh, struggle, but also how we can um, embolden uh, social struggle through cross-pollination, imagination, uh, energy, uh, and collective memory. So to illustrate this movement, um, I'm going to present three scenes uh, of activist practices through a process-based, uh, process-focused lens, um, and then show how this uh, focus on process allows us to connect knowledge production and community organizing through a methodology that attends simultaneously to the movement of composition and the composition of movements. So the first scene introduces Telestreet, um, a network of pirate television um, stations, as a socio-technical assemblage that connects neighbors um, through street television making in opposition to the isolating individualistic orientation of mainstream television, and in particular of Berlusconi's um, television. And looking at process, um, we see how sociality becomes centered uh, in this um, context, as opposed to um, just the spreading of counter-information, which is typical of alternative media. The second scene um, threads um, a connection with um, previous movements and forms the background for uh, important threshold changes um, that shape new forms of media activism. And here, um, the uh, Process, the focus on process allows me to um, attend to the circulation of energies uh, instead of the political claims of the movements. With the third scene, um, I'm returning to Telestreet and zooming in on one of its nodes in SUTV. Um, and to really focus on the specific ways in which in SUTV, um, we can say repurposes media um, to connect movements and to foster social reproduction and care. So these scenes are all connected um, by visible elements uh, that I discuss, but I also uh, want to draw attention to the uh, myriad of invisible micro exchanges that are at times interpersonal and at times facilitated by historical memory and by other tra uh, traces that just, you know, like travel through and are carried over from one cycle of struggle to the other. Um, so the movement of composition that I mentioned can be tracked through what I call activist energetics. And the composition of movements can be solidified through what I will call um, connective activism, um, which is based on the concept of repurposing uh, media. Uh, and just as an aside, the book was actually supposed to be called uh, repurposing media, but uh, the uh, marketing department um, did not like the name at all because you couldn't uh, Google it. So uh, without further ado, let, let us move back to 2001 uh, when Silvio Berlusconi, the Italian media tycoon, won uh, a second term in the, um, in the elections and as prime minister and consolidated his media power um, to over 90% uh, of the media. Um, at the same time, well, shortly after, um, the Telestreet Network was born um, with these uh, micro television stations transmitting mostly on a neighborhood scale using UHF, like the analog um, television frequencies um, that commercial networks could not use. And in this graph, you kind of see uh, this very artistic graph. You can uh, kind of see of, um, how the analog um, waves get stopped by an obstacle. 
And um, what you have is a shadow clone where you can um, broadcast. The, the, um, I saw that Alessandro raised a hand. I don't know if that was a, a hiccup or there is something that is not working at the moment. Um, but uh, so in any case, this um, DIY transmission system was also connected to a peer-to-peer -peer network, um, a digital network. Um, using a, um, an archive uh, called NGVision that was broadcasting and sharing video material at a time when there was, uh, there was no broadband and only um, you know, slow dial-up uh, connections. Uh, the network was active until um, 2010 when Italy switched um, to digital broadcasting, though as a network it didn't really exist anymore, but there were still many um, nodes um, that uh, were there. And uh, through, the, um, you know, through this um, archive, they, um, people um, in Telestreet were really able to cut down on uh, production costs and really retain uh, their individual uh, programming choices, even though the, you know, the transmission was happening all over Italy. So at the time of hypermediation and spectacle, this kind of uh, independent media production really uh, lit um, the imagination of people like wildfire. And it um, um, and so within a few years, a couple of years actually, um, there were over 200 street televisions all over scattered all over the country. But it's also important to mention that um, Telestreet was not born in a vacuum. This was also the time of the um, you know, the social justice movement, the Battle of Seattle, the independent media centers, the Zapatista um, electronic disturbance, tactical media, reclaim the street parties, the, this, you know, summit protests, social forum, and also critique of media consolidation. And so um, there were a lot of media activist projects that were um, deeply intertwined with campaigns against corporate, um, you know, capitalism and uh, neoliberal ideas. And street televisions were particularly active at this time, which was an important time for um, radical media because um, activists uh, worked together with hackers to build new communication infrastructure that was free and independent and also catered to the needs of movements. And then the interactive and participatory um, character of the web went, you know, in a, fa uh, in a flash from being a thing of activists and, uh, you know, and uh, media makers to being um, something that is part of um, proprietary software and that has, you know, in a way co-opted many of these, uh, you know, initial um, uh, experiments. Um, so, Telestreet embodied this period in, uh, in you know, particular ways, mixing peer-to-peer -peer with um, technology with open source, creative commons licenses, but also multiple uh, political and, uh, and um, uh, artistic traditions from data to theater, from, um, you know, political radio to militant research. I met Telestreet um, uh, through the activists of Orfeo TV and Candida TV when uh, they presented this new network at the um, Transmediale Festival in Berlin where I was living. And initially when I joined the movement, I was um, just supporting multilingual, uh, multilingual production. Uh, I was joining actions every time I went to Italy and I was accompanying them um, at international um, events. Eventually I became a member of Insu TV in Naples, uh, my hometown, and together, um, in addition to co-producing media, um, we set up a collaborative um, form of research inspired by the Italian autonomous tradition of con ricerca, um, which is very alive in uh, the movements in Italy. And con ricerca or inchiesta uh, inquiry um, really uses similar um, you know, techniques to traditional research, only the um, the priorities and the questions of the research are set and the research is also carried out by the people involved. Um, and Conricerca is considered by um, autonomous activists a form of organizing in itself. Um, and so when, once this research, research started, it became quite clear that, uh, that Telestreet was not really an anti-Berlusconi stunt. There was a lot more to it. Um, as a matter of fact, the framing of uh, Telestreet as an anti-Berlusconi movement really um, takes the attention away from the street where so much 
uh, happens through media making and you know like just basically um, focuses us on the discourse and the positioning of the movement. Um, for anyone who was involved, it was clear that Telestreet was actually uh, about making community. And uh, this was particularly visible in the model of proxy vision, which means vision from close and as opposed to the model of uh, vision from far. And uh, so for this model, um, what matters is not how many people watch television, but how many people make television together. Media activism is often associated with the discursive and with circulating counter information, whereas what we have um, with this proxy vision model is really like a blowing up of the traditional communication models. Um, and the creation of a completely different assemblage that has in a way technical power and interlocks, you know, tech rigs, um, traditions of resistance, um, discourses about consumption, but also, you know, the, the um, social and libidinal elements of, um, you know, being together. And um, so this um, complex assemblage can, um, you know, achieves political uh, power, uh, even though it's important to um, mention that not all assemblages are inherently um, emancipatory. Um, but this kind of assemblage really um, allows the uh, people involved in Telestreet, the Telestreetai, to find their fulfillment and the joy of being together, the pleasure of making things um, together in ways that are outside of the main, of the binds from a mainstream media and the individualist um, subject issue. So let me move to the um, to the second uh, um, the second scene where we go back in time and um, we um, you know I could I could have gone back to the seventies because um, a lot of the inf uh, influence on uh, Telestreet can also be found in the autonom autonomous um, culture of production of the seventies but I would like to bring uh, up actually some other stories that are um, that have almost been forgotten in particular the 1989 1990 movement student movement called La Pantera the Panther and the renaissance of the um, autonomous um, self-run uh, social centers that also happened more or less at the same time. So in 1989 uh, in Palermo uh, in December, students rose up against um, the uh, corporatization of the university the, uh, and the uh, privatiz privatization of research funding. They were also, again, uh, they were advocating for uh, free information and uh, opposed Berlusconi's attempts at using you know, corrupt politicians to consolidate his media power. By 1990, this movement had rapidly expanded throughout Italy um, under the name of La Pantera, the Panther, um, taking its name from a runaway panther from a zoo in Rome that seemed really hard to catch. Um, <clears throat> the uh, students of La Pantera occupied a lot of the buildings of universities. They self-managed classes and in collaboration with some professors. And they experimented with the communication means that became available because they could access the, um, the tech labs of um, the universities. This is still a time where you know, media making technology was expensive. My first, first encounter actually with, the, with this independent media making was at one of the assemblies in uh, Naples at uh, um, La Pantera, the occupation where they screened an ad that was comparing the, the Panther that had run away to this movement and, uh, you know, in a way, um, b b uh, starting a wave of culture jamming and like a branding of the, the movement that was um, partly also uh, inspired by um, conversations with um, some of the activists from the 70s. Um, in addition to culture jamming and using, uh, you know, independent media making, um, uh, La Pantera became known as Il Movimento de Fax, the Fax movement, um, because um, having access to the Fax um, machines that were in the offices of the university, the uh, students could develop a grid to coordinate actions across different universities. So faxes were used to circulate updates, to also uh, reach government um, and, um, and the press directly into their offices in a formal, like almost like direct action. But even more groundbreaking than this was actually the um, appropriation of the uh, virtual address extension, the BACS computer um, network in the science department. 
this network was much more powerful than the uh, phone cables that uh, people used for the BBA um, as the bulletin board systems. The back grid was uh, connected into um, a proprietary system um, network called DECnet. Um, and uh, it really allowed people to have uh, real-time communication. Um, at the time, this was really space age technology and um, it allowed students to access the remote disks, which were as big as washing machines, um, to manage mailing lists, to, um, chats, and also other kinds of activities. And once they integrated this uh, network with the fax network, OccupaNet was born, which was like a nationwide um, you know, infrastructure for the occupation of universities. Um, and this became really a threshold for the recomposition of the field of media activism. It was particularly important, not just um, to develop practices within Italy, but it was also a really important um, point of connection with China, where um, students were protesting the government um, on Tiananmen Square. And the government, the Chinese government, didn't know that um, this network was still active. And so every day, the students in Italy would um, clean up the messages that they received from China uh, from their masking headlines and fax them straight to the news uh, in Italy. And, um, and it was never clear how uh, this information was reaching people. So um, these universities were really filled to the brim 24-7 with seminars, discussion groups, this media making and everything else. And uh, Occupanet was really an important um, part of the exchanges because it also makes mundane communication with discussions of politics. And it really exposes students to affordances of technology that were, you know, like unheard of before. So it was really thrilling. Um, and um, it allowed the beginning of certain conversations about the affordances of technology and how to hack into them uh, in a way that, uh, you know, uh, mirror the prefigurative politics of um, movements that are involved in this hacking. So decision, you know, like um, consensus decision making, horizontal uh, organizing, diversity of practices, and so on. Um, so these experiments really catalyzed transformations and creations that exceeded the act of circulating information and communicating. As this information circulated around in the, um, in the networks, um, it really set off a series of relays between the um, technical and the social, uh, pushing the limits of what was possible, both for activism and, both, and for technology. And both the uh, Pantera movement and Sabotax, the one that was um, started in 94 and was somewhat similar, pumped new energy into political spaces that had become somewhat dormant after the um, repression of the 70s. And so in the early 90s, new technologies and DIY punk um, ethics really um, started uh, you know, informing activists uh, at the same time as um, they were also understanding the shape-shifting um, character of capital and how communication played a role in this, um, you know, in the, the different forms of oppression that capital perpetrates. So new social centers were created all over Italy. In Naples, for instance, um, one of the social centers that was created was called Tiananmen, which um, reminds us of um, Tiananmen Square protests, but also in Neapolitan dialect uh, means uh, don't forget. Uh, the um, other um, things that were important and interesting uh, and that uh, galvanized people were police crackdowns on some of this organizing as well as the first Iraq uh, war um, protest in 1990. Um, and also the way in which um, these spaces became, these social technical spaces became really uh, spaces for uh, people to thrive uh, through a variety of different kinds of experiments. Um, Italy was the first country uh, in Southern Europe to organize hack meetings and many of these um, hack, um, hacker spaces were located in the social centers. So the proximity of um, hackers and activists really um, brought hacker culture into, um, into activism and radical politics into hacking. Um, 
um, also, you know, previous infrastructure like the um, uh, uh, the free radius uh, participated by hosting uh, BBS systems and then later on servers. And, and there was a lot of mixing of different forms of media from, uh, you know, analog to uh, digital and, you know, vice versa. Um, and in the 90s, then starting in 96, collectives like Isola de Nella Rete started providing, uh, you know, mirroring services, encryption, uh, listservs uh, to uh, militant groups. In, in this context, I'd like to also mention the, um, you know, the importance of tech uh, collectives and how they have been doing and performing a kind of effective uh, care labor that is not uh, visible, but that ha is really important for the decomposition of re and recomposition of um, social movements. So uh, looking at all these relations, um, you know, we can really start seeing how energy was traveling um, through these spaces um, and was re and experiments were really, technology was feeding experiments with new lines of subjectivation. Um, the energy was uh, really, uh, you know, visible. And um, as someone participated in these um, spaces, um, I was really seeing how these, you know, like chance encounters, how these collaborations, these conversations were really, um, you know, pro um, uh, proliferating uh, different experiences and, um, and experiments. It's also important to mention that this wasn't only happening in Italy, uh, and that Italy itself was plugged into a wider network of international groups, um, you know, through collaborations from Palestine to um, Chiapas, from, um, you know, hack meetings to a variety of tactical media festivals and so on. So, um, one other thing to mention is that the this energy is not is not always positive. Uh, you know, it also feeds divergent stimuli that actually decompose. Um, you know, uh, collectives, and so um, I'm trying to locate this process of composition and decomposition in these sociological, uh, socio-technical spaces because um, this is where a lot of the energy is relayed. Moving to the third um, scene. Um, so in one of the most exciting conversations about becoming a media activist, Nicola Grisano told me um, about a summer in 2003, um, going to a summer camp in Frassanito in uh, Southern Italy um, to uh, protest um, uh, det uh, detention centers and uh, Im uh, you know, re the repression of um, immigration. And um, just by chance, he ended up um, with a camera in hand uh, while uh, breaking into a, a detention center. Um, yes, that happened. And, um, and so the, you know, still by chance, Nicola managed to also hide the tapes from the police before they destroyed all um, the evidence. And the video that came out of it uh, really galvanized no border politics in Italy and also somewhat in Europe. Um, Alice, since then, I could not put the camera down is all that Nicola needs to, te uh, to tell me. And I can feel from his uh, voice that, um, uh, you know, there is a power uh, that is felt in wielding a camera against injustice. Similar transformations also happened uh, to people who were involved in uh, the third global forum um, in Naples and the G8 summit in Genoa in 2001, where the first uh, nodes of um, Italian in the media were set up. Um, but with this um, emerging subjectivity of the, um, the media activists, also a series of conundrums um, started emerging, in particular, you know, tying technology and uh, organizing uh, problems with inclusion and diversity of voices um, that we're often familiar with, um, you know, control and moderation of news uh, lists and things like this, but also, and importantly, um, a debate um, about the differences uh, and the between being an activist and a media activist. And still, in a way, um, media activism wasn't always considered as a form of organizing, just like some kind of um, additional superstructure in a rather crusty Marxist um, you know, um, attitude. Um, there, also during this time, there was a lot of uh, burnout, surveillance, and police repression, especially during the summits and right after. And so this fed a lot of divergent stimuli, uh, you know, creating problems and burnout. And Nicola um, 
actually was at this uh, no border camp to try and cure um, uh, burnout without completely disengaging from uh, from politics. And so the encounter with the camera really spurred a new kind of relation where, um, you know, Simon Don would say the individuation of Nicola as a media activist as part of a movement of media activists, what you would call um, indi um, psychosocial individuation, um, you know, and also the individuation of the camera as a weapon, which is a sort of um, technical in, uh, individuation. So this, in, um, this kind of, you know, new assemblage really um, started having more political agency and, uh, you know, it grew as other people who were part of the camp and other activists from Naples joined Nicola to uh, create Insu TV. And just uh, as an aside, Nicola actually doesn't really exist. Nicola Angrizano is the collective pseudonym that we all use as part of Insu TV. Um, so as I move on to um, discuss um, Insu TV, please try to hold uh, on to this understanding of the metastability of projects, um, because they're always in tension, um, and there is always this tension between what they are and what they can be. And when the tension releases, then the components scatter in different places, and uh, one can find their traces in the least expected um, places. And this, for me, is not uh, what I, con I would consider failure. Um, this really speaks um, for me to how movements change and how resistance can uh, continue. So in this sense, my perspective also tries to shift the focus away from uh, you know, um, discourses of uh, failures and successes in social movements that have been very uh, prominent. So Naples is one of the um, large um, one of the largest cities in Italy and has the highest population. Um, and uh, Insu TV is set up in the uh, social center of Officina or was, uh, with a really large antenna that was donated to them by the workers of a shipyard on strike, um, and that turned into a co-op. And um, you know uh, the Insu TV uh, people helped them make a documentary about it. So with this real, you know, with this infrastructure, actually, it could reach a really large audience, but. What is interesting is that um, some of this audience was not just watching from home, they would come and participate in the production, or at least in the live shows that were, um, you know, being created. These live shows, um, often talk shows were, um, uh, and also screenings of documentaries were highly participatory. The, uh, you know, in the context of uh, the talk shows, there would be, um, you know, topics and guests coming in, um, and having conversations, also helping different groups uh, create documentaries. There would be entertainment, and there would be a thematic cooking show. Uh, and you know, the event would end with the sharing of food. Um, so, in and so people would come and actually take part in this. And what I see in this kind of um, work, and I'll tell you more about it uh, in a second, is really what I uh, have come to understand as a form of um, what I call repurposing media, which is really uh, not just about the repurposing of media as, uh, you know, technology or even the repurposing of spaces as, uh, you know, like the shadow cones or the social centers. It's really, it's less about the reuse of technology and more about the harnessing of encounters and events. And so repurposing describes a set of alternative media practices um, that bend and hack what is available to foster social cohesion rather than communication in itself. And so here is where we're moving to a focus on social reproduction. So for example, the documentary Wasting Naples on the um, atrocious uh, garbage strike that lasted almost a year uh, in Italy is, uh, you know, was created participatory after um, people that in SUTV had trained to um, do in inquiry and to document what they were saying came back with over 500 hours of footage. But the connective potential of this uh, making didn't end there. Actually, Nicola Grisano, once the film was, um, uh, the documentary was uh, finished, um, was invited to screen uh, and talk about the filmmaking practices um, and obviously the garbage strike everywhere in Italy and also outside of Italy. 
and um, and also was invited uh, to you know undertake new collaborations. And so and also since Nicola Grisano is not just one person, it was also really interesting to see how we could be ubiquitous in different places. So in SUTV calls itself a media connective, as Alex was mentioning, not a media collective. And this is where um, so much of my um, thinking has been shaped um, because I see this idea of a media connective or in, you know, like the um, force of connective activism as a way of creating and tending to spaces and infrastructures of intersubjectivity where collectivity emerges through a set of creative practices that also facilitate all these macro exchanges that I have been talking about. So in this sense, it mobilizes repurposing as a way of conceptualizing not only the unique character of Minsu TV, um, but also in general, a set of struggles over um, social reproduction that uh, autonomous feminism calls for. Um, and for me to come to a good understanding of um, the composition of the activist field and how uh, this understanding can shape our movements um, are really questions that are entangled. And so we can start answering them simultaneously um, by um, setting up these autonomous um, or academic research processes, but also these media making processes that foreground listening, collaboration, experimentation, and that break down the, um, you know, like the um, barriers of identity based interaction uh, because people are focused on the making of uh, the films. So moving to my, um, you know, last two sections, um, let me say, first of all, that the, um, you know, the alliance of development from, uh, you know, between, you know, different kinds of activism across cycle of struggles, like, for instance, from Radio Lice in 1976 in Bologna to Radio Gap in uh, 2001 in Genoa, or between Autonomia and, uh, you know, the global justice movement are not lines of direct affiliation. Um, they are actually part of you know, what I would define as nonlinear processes of energy relays and positive feedback loops between the technological and the social realms. So that, um, you know, you, you have this movement between spaces and sites of encounters, but also, you know, from a chat over a beer to a full blown experiment from, you know, the forests of Chiapas to tinkering with technology, uh, you know, from free radios to BBS systems. So there is, um, you know, it's, this circulation is not non-linear. Um, and, but this kind of hacking and tinkering and exchanges between bodies and technologies are really what are at the core of connective activism. And that, and what um, you know transform um, us um, when we come together um, and form assemblages that are not stable, they are metastable. So they're constantly reshaping themselves as new components come into composition. You know, sometimes gaining more power, sometimes gaining less power. Um, but this kind of focus for me also allows um, us to reframe how we study media um, across cycles of struggle and away from monolithic representations of what movements are. Um, and also what allows us to, you know, to really think about the relationship between the technological components and the social components, as opposed to just taking for granted that certain movements use certain technologies. Um, and so this focus on the composition also moves us away from uh, conversations about failure to uh, conversation about what travels across cycles of struggle and in a way foregrounding um, some of these um, tools and ideas that can be taken on and transformed elsewhere. Um, so studying media from a perspective of movement energetics uh, focuses on how media ecologies and social ecologies are entangled in complex ways instead of taking for granted uh, the adoption of these technologies that I was mentioning. Um, and to understand the um, capacity of media ecologies um, to constantly change, one must really consider the energetic potential of the system, um, also at the moment of decomposition, so when things you know, when groups cannot retain their stability and their, um, you know, traces scatter elsewhere. Um, and so this is what I tried to show, and I hope I succeeded, you know, like by pointing at all these um, divergent energies and how they sometimes come into communication to condition political in invent uh, invention across different cycles of struggle. 
um, technology, especially today, uh, plays an important role and it has agency, we could say. Um, so how do the contemporary um, forms of mediated activism function uh, in the larger activist field and what can activism do today? Um, the challenge is really um, to understand uh, current formations in uh, dynamic interaction, both with the activist and the non-activist milieu, to try and figure out how the compositions really engender new forms of agency, or in some cases, prevent it. Um, so the new activist mediascape is a heterogeneous network, but also fragmented. Think about the amount of time and work and being together that is required to do something like street television and what it takes to just have an you know, a mobile phone and an Instagram platform and just to stream, uh, you know, as a one person band. Um, and so it's really important for us to start understanding, um, you know, uh, the relation between technology and movements, not just as here is technology and here are movements, because this only gives us a partial explanation of how things function. And this explanation usually leads us to critique corporate um, technology as, uh, you know, exploiting and, uh, you know, uh, uh, facilitating surveillance and you know other kinds of technologies as um, being inherently um, helpful, which is not the case. So for me, it's really important to say that in a way there is no longer alternative media, that there are only um, alternative media assemblages that are in ongoing recomposition. Uh, and this, from a perspective of research, means that we have to start thinking about, thinking through movement and composition a new every time we encounter a new project and every time we encounter uh, a new group of people. Um, and in a similar way, if there is a politics of knowledge, uh, it's also important to think about the production of subjectivity and the work of social reproduction that entangles researchers and the research. Um, within SUTV, I've learned how this kind of uh, relationship can be ethical and can uh, you know, really uh, be productive uh, for people. Um, you know, connected research can forge different ways of being together and do so with care. But like many participatory processes that uh, neoliberalism really uh, promotes, um, this kind of approach without the care and the ethical, uh, you know, nuances really becomes a, a method for knowledge extraction. And so building connections between activists and organizations and individuals is not just a matter of um, you know, naming a condition or providing some kind of theoretical connections. It's really about embodying um, these connections um, and to engage in struggles over the production of reality. So in my experience participating in movements, uh, groups don't always talk or very seldom uh, actually talk about the um, relationships among groups unless they're trying to figure out how to build some alliances. What also is not talked about is the affordances of technology and what uh, the technology that is chosen really allows us to do. And so this lack of shared reflection really um, you know, it makes groups vulnerable to fragmentation, to isolation, of surveillance, and, you know, but also bad communication habits. Uh, what I found interesting is that in Naples, um, you know, like, Napolitans ask the same thing that I ask also as a researcher, how groups can retain uh, porosity to, you know, pro proliferate struggles. So um, what lures us together uh, with them and then, you know, like a way, what kind of compositionality um, makes the um, social fabric political? And there is value in considering the becoming of groups in relation to each other. That's where we're not moving through the axis of vertical, but horizontal, because focus, focusing on the relationship uh, between groups is uh, more insightful than examining um, how um, civil society engages with uh, power, because it reveals how the psychosociality of the activist itself is a terrain for organizing and building momentum. And this is where the, um, you know, the um, uh, uh, theories of autonomous feminists on um, social reproduction and insurgents of social reproduction become, become important. And in this sense, the activist, you know, the term activist field itself is not particularly uh, useful to really encapsulate these micro relations that I've been pointing to uh, and that are the basis of political interaction because it's not really just identity that brings us 
to movements. It's much more the affects of being together, the excitement of protests and um, you know, of uh, feeling part of a group. Um, and so uh, Napolitans have been asking for a long time, you know, across cycles of struggle, how to uh, keep this compositionality, how to keep this porosity. And this has taken different kinds of, um, you know, efforts uh, from co-research, looking at the new composition of movements to psychosocial therapy uh, through media making and fun. Um, and, uh, you know, using uh, co-research as a mode of uh, investing in resubjectivation um, through uh, asking questions about our own communities and territories. Um, so repurposing both of research and of, um, of media harbors the potential um, to foster recomposition for assemblages that have political agency. Um, and this may not be necessarily unique to Naples, but it's definitely, uh, you know, it stands out in the uh, histories that I have encountered. Silvia Federici, um, you know, um, talks about um, reproductive care and effective labor as key components of the persistence of capitalist systems. Um, you know, she says that political movements that fail to create new forms of social reproduction are destined to be reabsorbed into the mechanism of the capitalist system. And, uh, you know, communication and language are particularly important today with the new forms of, um, you know, social mediation that we have, um, because they're attached to the living body of the worker, and particularly networker, uh, networked communication technologies, uh, you know, are important aspects where social reproduction happens. Um, and so it's really important um, to, um, you know, to really think about the relationship between our media use and social reproduction. And so I'm going to conclude just with um, two um, brief insights that I, uh, you know, uh, I sum up from my field work. The first one is that at a time where communication has become an important site of struggle, media activism really needs to wrestle the sphere of communication from processes of overproduction and re redirect them towards um, social reproduction within movements. The second one is that uh, it's really important to recognize the strategic importance of sustenance, care, and effective work within movements to allow this porosity, the you know, healthy con uh, communication and uh, proliferation. And this may require a reconceptualization of um, what we consider political work. Um, so um, in general, I you know, advocate for um, what autonomous feminists like uh, Fulvia Serra define as insurgent modes of social reproduction that really focus on intimacy and social ties away from the enclosures of, uh, you know, social media and communicative capitalism in general. And to really um, think what activism, connective activism can look like um, today because it's not necessarily clear. And so the question uh, for activists, but also for engaged scholarship is one of thinking um, how to understand and facilitate this uh, composition of assemblages um, outside of the narrow and you know, unimaginative confines of capitalism, heteropatriarchy, colonialism, white supremacy, and ableism. And so in this sense, just to conclude, um, I think it's important to think or rethink also together with political action, also what we consider agency. And to me, agency is really about the ability to come into composition and to stay tuned into the milieu of the changing potentialities that uh, exist. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. Thank you for that explanation, that rich and complex over 30 year old over 30 year history. And I'm so glad you spoke to your methodological choices and the role of care. There is so much in there. Um, I just want to remind people in attendance that you can ask questions in the Q&A box below. We're just going to read first names. We've already had a few questions come in. So the first question comes from Megan. They write, I read your book for um, Professor B.L. Coleman's class at McGill um, paired with Juwani's Pedagogies of Hope. In our discussions, I kept coming back to Quebec Corps. At its humble beginnings, Quebec Corps might have been the art of the week or a way, or at least a way to bolster and fund the art of the week as explained in Juwani's piece. A television setup like Telestreet seems like it could succeed in a time and place 
where television still ruled. I'm curious what would be an equivalent action that a group could pose against Quebec core that would have similar subversive properties. Sorry, I have to read the question again. It's um, the audio is coming a little uh, choppy. Oh, sorry. It's the question from Megan. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, this is a really interesting question and, you know, it's one that I am uh, still considering. So I'm not sure exactly about, uh, you know, Quebec core and, you know, like what kind of um, connective activism could, uh, you know, emerge in response to that. But um, there are ways that I'm seeing and that I'm also involved in that are um, are really taking data activism and other forms of, um, you know, media making that challenges, uh, you know, representation, but also, uh, you know, brings um, uh, people together um, through, for instance, the kind of work that I am uh, doing with uh, friends and colleagues in uh, Park X at the moment with uh, anti eviction mapping. Um, there have been, um, you know, the kind of work that I'm seeing uh, done around social reproduction in, in the US, especially around the, you know, the emergency of police brutality. I'm thinking about um, uh, the social emergency centers that uh, the design studio for social intervention develops. So there are a variety of different ways. The thing is that um, in order to figure out what, you know, like what solution to develop, you have to really frame the problem in a way that lends itself to giving it a solution. And so it, what are the, you know, like, it's really important to think about how Quebec core is functioning now and, you know, like um, what are the ways in which one can engage with it? Uh, oh. Thank you, Megan. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> thank you. Carrie, would you like to read the next question? Um, yes. So Sandra asks, given your argument, what is your critique of network analysis as a research method? Hi, Sandra. Uh, that's a great question. And it's actually, I can, uh, I can probably uh, give you an anecdote to uh, tell you partly what I think. So I started doing, you know, continuing this work in Naples. Um, I was starting to um, look at the uh, contemporary activist uh, field in Naples to figure out, you know, like which groups were communicating with uh, which. So really looking at the composition and I was working with an RA who was really enthusiastic about network analysis. And so uh, we kept on, uh, you know, uh, discussing and my RA was uh, saying, you know, this is really gonna help us. And I was like, mm, I don't know. So we ended up actually collecting uh, quite a lot of data over a period of time during, uh, you know, mobilizations. And they were especially, I think it was around uh, gentrification uh, struggles in uh, Naples. And once we started doing the network analysis, basically we realized that um, there was absolutely no overlap between the network, you know, like the nodes that were on social media and the nodes that were uh, actually existing on the ground. And I was, quite sure of that, but it was interesting to see reflected on a digital map. The map looked beautiful, but uh, the thing is that in a place like Naples, uh, where there are so many spaces where people come together, where there are these socio-technical spaces, all there is an entire network of uh, social centers and cultural uh, production spaces. There are squares where you know people hang out. You don't need social media to communicate and so so much of the um actually interaction the conversations and the organizing is by word of mouth and in the same way you know i'm seeing that in some kinds of struggles here are um you know like they're uh <laughs> just, okay i will <laughs> when i have time uh you know like in the you know places like montreal as well there is uh there is, um, you know, word of mouth is much more important than actually, um, you know, outreach through media. Thank you so much for that. And um, also in the chat, um, a request was made to publish more work about this. And um, the next question comes from, I'm guessing the first name is Greg, 
Uh, Greg writes, there is, I find, a provocation in your book in composition and media activism, that the results of composition, e.g. community building, are vastly different than what we usually think should be the effects of media activism, e.g. the unattainable radical and immediate transformation of the world. How does composition trans how does composition transforms how we should understand activism? Another excellent question. Uh, well, so in a way, it depends on who the we is, because composition has been at the core of understanding, um, you know, organizing in uh, Italy, especially in the tradition of autonomous uh, Marxism, which is quite uh, strong in Italy for a long time. And so Con Ricerca was developed to understand the new composition of, you know, the groups, because they were actually like, uh, organizers were not seeing a correspondence between, you know, the structures that existed, like the unions and, um, you know, the party, and how these younger people were coming to the factories were really seeing their way of um, expressing dissent. There was sabotage, there were, you know, like slowing down the machine, there were a variety of different things. And so uh, I think Composition transforms how we understand activism only insofar as it gives us another lens to think about the field of activism and how to care for it. So, and, and how to, you know, like, how to understand how to galvanize, create critical mass and also potentially whether there is a need to shift certain practices and certain strategies. Wonderful. Um, there, I just want to, uh, oh, we got another question right at perfect time. Um, so yeah, so for everyone participating, you can feel free to ask questions below. Carrie, would you like to read the next question from Antonio? Um, sure, but before I read it, um, maybe we could close the PowerPoint presentation to enlarge the speaker. Oh, see, sure, sorry, I forgot. Amazing. Voila. Okay, the next question is from Antonio. He asks, can you expand on the concept of energy within these activist groups? What have you found to be the conditions that foster energy? Yeah, so um, I use energy um, from a theoretical perspective um, using a Simondonian uh, you know, framework where energy is also considered information. So, at the level of the individual or the collective, this is literally the information that comes through perception and triggers changes in the individual, you know, like any kind of reaction. Um, but it's also information that travels from the technical circuits into, you know, the social circuits and also creates these um, relays that I was talking about uh, between the social and the technical. So, um, so in that sense, energy is really anything that um, keeps people together happy in a way, doing things together, um, you know, in a way that expands the purview of activism from just focusing on certain goals and campaigns, which can be exhausting and is exhausting and should be done in any case, um, also to the joy of being together, so to having community. And, and so really energy can be anything from, um, you know, going to a screening to dancing. Wonderful. Um, I guess I'll ask a, a question that I have. Um, so one thing is in your talk, you were you mentioned this kind of shared pseudonym, which enables this kind of sense of ubiquity, right? And able to like uh, have the sense of being in many places at once, but maybe also a sense of anonymity. And that kind of raised the question of when you were talking about the role of community members taking part in television making and coming onto shows and participating in the cooking shows, I, I also have this kind of question about what is the role of risk for the people that are involved in this media production? You know, like they're, they're recorded, was there a risk in taking part in the cooking shows as well? Kind of like, how are people understanding the role of risk in that participation? versus the role of community building and transformation? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. I never thought about it. So 
the the spaces themselves, I mean, it depends on how you define risk, right? So if you're just thinking at a basic level, uh, risk is coming out of your comfort zone, um, then yes, because you could be in the audience. Next thing you know, you're holding a microphone. And you know that's how I start. I was in the audience. And next thing I know, I'm doing an interview. Um, you know, like uh, you may be helping people, you know, like roll up cables and everything. So um, there is that. Um, Sometimes with the topics, there may be obviously a risk of revealing yourself, but uh, there is usually a good degree of attention to uh, the risks of anonymity. So for instance, in uh, um, when uh, we did a, an episode of the talk show Domenica out in Toronto, uh, we were, one of the topics was uh, about the uh, pollution that um, diesel trains were causing in the neighborhood. And there was a person who um, was an engineer that had been working for the companies and came with a mask and then took part in uh, the event. Um, in terms of running the televisions, there has, no one has ever been arrested. Uh, pirate television is pirated, so it's illegal in a certain way, but it falls also into the loopholes of um, media regulation. And so um, there was actually, sadly, the, the, the only channel, well, the first channel that was uh, run by strikers in a factory was shut down by the, the police. Um, but otherwise, the only other channel that was closed down was um, one that was run by uh, people, um, uh, neurodiverse people. And uh, it was, it, it was a, a really solid, great community-based uh, project in a small town. And because it was so successful, um, it was in a way uh, posing uh, um, as a sort of competition to the other local private um, channels that were uh, making money through advertisement. And so it was them who went to the police and actually had it shut down. But otherwise, it's, um, yeah, there haven't, um, I wouldn't say that there have been any particular risks. Thank you. Um, I, that, that's so interesting. Um, I just want to remind people, if you want to ask any more questions, we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. I was wondering, I don't want to put you on the spot, Carrie, but also if you have a question, you can also feel free to ask. Um, and in the meantime, perhaps, because you were covering so much in your talk. And again, it was so rich. I was wondering if you could maybe, you kind of talked about this a bit at the end, but if you could maybe talk a little bit more about your choices of navigating um, the role between ethnography and activism and the role of carrying your methodology, just because there's a lot of your book, right? Like speaking towards that, but I just maybe for audience members who haven't had the chance yet to read the book. Sure. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, um, so there are a couple of things, um, you know, the people I was working with are all people that were, um, comfortable with research and were, you know, in a way, part of the research that were, you know, like some of the people in the collective were, you know, like coming up with the, uh, with the uh, uh, questionnaires, um, you know, with ideas who we were discussing um, some of the research results. Um, so it's um, what was probably one of the, you know, like trickier parts was how to, um, you know, uh, not break the trust in terms of what I was, um, you know, discussing. Um, because so much, you know, of the, you know, so many of the conversations happen as friends. It wasn't just a bunch of interviews, you know, like it was so much about exchanges. And so um, the way I have addressed it and partly, you know, it's, you know, partly is what drove me to kind of do the work that I've been doing and the writing that I've been doing. It's really to not, you know, I could have written a book that just describes what Telestreet does, done an analysis of some of the videos and just portrayed them, uh, you know, for everyone to know and see. But what I was interested in doing was more to try and um, carry forward the creative potential that characterizes the, the network and really try to produce some provocations about um, you know, what it means to produce um, militant research that is not just about supporting movements. Um, so what I write is not necessarily what I have done. So much of the work that you know, people appreciated was because we were together doing things. 
And then when I'm writing, I'm, you know, like writing about Simon Don and I'm writing about repurposing media and connective activism, which are concepts that at the end of the day, I am developing to try and give some consistency to um, this kind of work. Um, and this has also informed the kind of work that I've been doing after so that um, I've done a variety of different other collaborations with activist groups in other parts of the world. And um, one of the things that I try and do is to try to, you know, make myself uh, sparse or like not indispensable um, so that, um, you know, even if I'm not around, um, people can continue doing the work that they can do, uh, that they want to do, and it's useful for them because they have decided. So I'm taking the lead and following what people want, um, especially because, you know, being an academic now is um, you're bound to the um, cycles of semesters and, you know, like deadlines and not being able to be around all the time. And so it's really so much of the work that I do is about, uh, you know, open up opening up spaces, facilitating this composition, bringing different groups together uh, in different ways and trying to, um, you know, like let things emerge that are already there. Awesome, thank you so much for that. Um, we have another question and maybe the last question um, in terms of time, but Vicky writes, how do you envision disabled participation in these movements? The, uh, I have seen it. I haven't, you know, it's like, it depends obviously on uh, your disabilities, but I have seen a blind person make, you know, walking around with a camera and filming. Uh, that was one of my first encounters at the uh, first national convention of uh, Telestreet. Uh, I met people on the spectrum. I met people who, um, you know, made videos about uh, architectonic barriers and they were groundbreaking, they won awards. Um, I, so it's, um, you know, it depends really, but it's, it's not so much about how I can envision is like how different people who come to this technology can envision themselves coming into composition with the technology. And then it's about, you know, it's all about us, you know, like having to abandon our, uh, abandon our uh, preconceived ideas of what media making and, you know, media products should look like. Thank you. I mean, that was the last question we had in the chat, but I was wondering if there were any words you wanted to kind of like end on any like final takeaways besides the takeaways you offered at the end of your presentation, but just if there's anything you want to say to conclude. It, uh, well, uh, so perhaps I can say a couple of uh, words about um, you know, what uh, we're doing now. I'm still working with Institute TV and uh, there has been a lot because of the pandemic, but we're trying to develop a collaborative, um, a participatory archive that um, in a way repurposes the idea of the archive. So it's a, it's built by hackers, it's uh, horizontal, it doesn't use corporate media, but we're trying to figure out also how to create this archive in a way that is, um, you know, that is um, conducive to more engagement. And so, it, you know, it creates a bridge in a way with, uh, between, you know, like historical memory of uh, 20 years of media making in Naples and, um, you know, in the future now. Um, and yeah, in general, I just find that for me, it's really hard now to, uh, you know, think about organizing a technology without uh, actually using these lenses and like posing these questions that I have learned, uh, you know, from, all these people. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really a great experience to actually feel so, um, you know, feel very lucky that I have been able to um, dedicate so much time uh, and thinking to being with amazing people that are really inspiring. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And it's such an honor for your first public book talk to be part of the series. Thank so thank you so much. <laughs> and thank you everyone for coming. We have two events next week and uh, five more events total for the rest of the semester. So I hope you can join us at them as well. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to stop the recording now. And uh, thank have you a great everyone, evening. friends and non-friends who have come and joined. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.